Okay, all in good time. <laughs> Gosh, okay. <laughs> uh, I'll settle down. <laughs> There's a lot of technology going on here. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about, you know, some of the work we've been doing about you know, really mostly focusing on the sort of circadian biology and how that impacts on medicine and possibly may give us some opportunities in the future. Um, I'm going to start off talking a little bit about um, sleep. Um, sleep's a really complex uh, behaviour. And why am I talking about sleep? I'm not really a sleep biologist. Well, um, um, sleep is kind of quite intimately intertwined with the operation of the circadian clock. And I guess for most people, uh, the readout of their clock that they're most aware of is their sleep behavior. Um, you, as you'll testify yourself, having flown from the States, even though you're tired, you can't sleep properly because you're trying to sleep against your clock. And it, well, don't worry, I'll crash. <laughs> <laughs> so um, these, these are just some sort of observations about this very dramatic change in sleep. And I thought we'd include this because last time we were talking with George in a pub in Oxford about um, some of the issues around the sort of epidemiology of, of looking at sort of sleep circadian uh, biology. And of course, a lot of these changes have been so incredibly pervasive across the societies that we're, we're interested in. It's very hard to find a sort of proper control group in, in order to study. But you can see the very dramatic changes in sleep behavior over a relatively short period of time. Um, and we're all aware of this kind of interesting phenomenon of social jet lag, which is sleeping different schedules at weekends as opposed to during the working week. Um, there's also some really interesting work looking at how as the cost of illuminating our homes and our lives has dramatically dropped over the years, we sleep less and less. And because light perception is a major factor regulating sleep behavior and also our circadian rhythm, this major change in the amount of illumination we see is probably quite important. And it is important because in the US, it's been estimated that between 50 and 70 million people suffer adverse health consequences from sleep disorders and sleep deficiencies. And experimentally, we know that uh, these will include things like obesity, type 2 diabetes. So I'm just, I guess, persuading you that this is not something arcane, but something that perhaps we should be taking an interest in. <clears throat> and of course, this is a kind of straightforward one, really, which is that if you end up with people working on <laughs> night shifts uh, who are sleep deprived, then they'll make mistakes. And some of these mistakes have very major consequences. Um, so I'm uh, talking about the sort of starting off talking about sleep. Um, I'm trying to persuade you that sleep's important uh, as, as a sort of a way of understanding uh, how our circadian clock works. Um, so this is the two model, uh, the two process model of sleep, which um, uh, I'll, I'll briefly sort of talk you through. So process S. This is the sort of accumulation of sleep pressure the longer that you're awake. Um, so for example here, I don't know, is that, is that can you see it? Oh yeah. Um, um, so when you're asleep, the sleep pressure is dissipated and you wake up in the morning, you've got very little sleep pressure. The longer you're awake, the more your sleep pressure builds until you pay it off. And except if you go on and start very late at night or work a night shift. So the, the other problem underlying this is process C, which is, process, which is really the output of the circadian clock. So the circadian clock is driving wakefulness or sleepiness. And so sort of when you're awake, uh, initially, you've got this sort of increasing drive for wakefulness, which is paralleling the rise in sleep pressure. And then during the afternoon, and this is a sort of post-lunch dip, your process C starts to decline and the gap here between sleep pressure and the circadian drive to stay awake gradually diverges until you get to a, a point of pressure which is not matched by wakefulness and then you fall asleep. And you can see the problem is if you then try and sleep <clears throat> against your clock, you're now dealing with trying to pay off your sleep debt at the same time that you're um, your circadian clock is driving wakefulness, which is why um, it, we tend not to sleep as well after doing night shifts and so on. So this is a sort of long preamble, apologies. <laughs> I don't know how many of you are interested in this stuff, but um, uh, the clock itself. So we live on a rotating planet. So predictably, we go from um, day to night. 
it turns out all life on Earth, so fungi, plants, animals, have evolved separate mechanisms to anticipate this predictable change in the environment. So in mammals, the central clock is in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the face of the brain, where it receives light in information from the retina. But of course, it turns out that virtually every cell in the body has got its own autonomous oscillator. And the role of this central clock is really to sort of serve as a, a synchronizing signal to make sure that all the clocks are in phase and aligned with the external light-dark cycle. So that will make sense until you introduce electric lights, of course, and alarm clocks. So um, the downstream consequences of this are that you have clocks in, say, the lung and the liver, where um, the, the, the behavior of those organs varies by time of day um, in a predictable manner. So all this is possible because of the sort of core circadian oscillator. And this was the discovery of this mechanism that led to the Nobel Prize in 2017. So this is a transcription translation negative feedback loop or TTFL. So it's rather like a pendulum clock in that you have a positive arm here, which switches on production of, gene, oh, sorry, production of genes, which lead to proteins, which are repressors. So you get activation, which builds up repressors and then the repressors inhibit. And the, the time delays in each of these biochemical reactions adds up to about 24 hours, circa 24 hours, circa, circa diem, circa circadian. So my background's in medicine and uh, of course, um, many uh, human diseases show time of day variation in expression. So this is an example of inflammatory disease, but myocardial infarction, stroke, these all have a, a clear um, relation to the time of day. And it was, I remember a med school, med school being told the reason for joint stiffness in the morning and rheumatoid arthritis was because we hadn't been using our joints overnight. And of course, it's just so stories turn out to be entirely incorrect. And it's actually a, a drive. And here in the red line, you can see it's circulating into the six. In, in the serum. So this is, is, is actually being driven by clock within the immune system. So we've and, uh, had to include at least one slide which had uh, Debbie Lawler's uh, name on because we've quite enjoyed doing stuff together. <laughs> and uh, uh, we've been looking at various uh, cardiometabolic traits and inflammatory diseases in UK Biobank. And uh, this was one looking at um, a risk of asthma which we were thrilled because it actually was picked up by a popular publication. I, I've had to put the red line, it says night job hits lung. So um, I've never had any of my work previously um, receive any any interest <laughs> outside of very specialist. Uh, yeah, we were uh, company in figure wasn't. Uh, <laughs> it no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so, um, what else can I interest you in about this, the role of the clock? So uh, we often use drugs, um, and it's interesting to think about the role of timing in the efficacy or side effect profile of medication. So um, this is um, an extract from a, a nice paper led by John Hoganesh, who's a friend and colleague um, now in Cincinnati. And what he did was he extracted information from previously published trials and did a virtual analysis, a virtual trial, if you like, looking not to see whether, for example, prednisolone works in rheumatoid arthritis, but just, just to see whether the time at which the participants took the drug impacted on efficacy. And here's a, a, a seven trials looking at anti-inflammatory drugs, mostly in rheumatoid arthritis, all with positive readouts. And one of the common factors, which won't surprise you, is that the drugs which showed a time of day variation in efficacy tended to be drugs with short half-lives, which makes sense, of course, because it's uh, the alignment of the drug exposure with the drug target is probably going to dial up greatest efficacy. So I need to just pause and acknowledge um, my friend and colleague, Hannah Durrington, who's um, in Manchester still. I was in Manchester for many years, and she's running now with this um, uh, some uh, human clinical trials looking at time of day efficacy of anti-inflammatory drugs in um, in people with asthma, building on the shift work and on some of the other work we've done in the past. 
<laughs> so I'm going to introduce the idea now of um, circadian misalignment. Can I just ask, hmm. of course, yeah. all that data is the linked IL-6, or are there many, many other uh, immune regulators that so there are the same? Zyme yeah, so, so there are a number of other immune regulators. IL-6 is interesting because we find, and others have found, that interleukin-6 seems to both serve as a, a very important circulating cytokine, whereas many cytokines have more local sort of mechanisms of action. And also IL-6 um, uh, uh, seems to be one of the, the strongest circadian regulated and gated cytokines, both in terms of its production and its, uh, its, its action. So IL-6 often comes up in its screens, but there are others as well, things like lymphocyte trafficking, uh, IgA uh, production, and, and so on. So yeah, it's not just IL-6. So um, the idea here is um, that um, shift work is a relatively extreme challenge where we're requiring people to live against their clock. So their internal circadian uh, oscillation is now misaligned with the external light-dark cycle. So this idea of misalignment is quite important. But it's important also to note that almost all of us are living misaligned lives because of the presence of you know, artificial light in the evening. And this is uh, just an example from some colleagues in Oxford, but it, this has been shown extensively in animal models and in human studies, that artificial light in the evening uh, 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 shifts the uh, circadian phase. <clears throat> so what about misalignment and shift work? And um, just very briefly, this is uh, looking at shift work as a risk exposure and uh, looking at uh, metabolic liver disease in this particular instance. And I do realize I'm showing this slide in a center of excellence. And so um, <laughs> apologies uh, for, for uh, if there any shortcomings, but um, basically among the, the problems we have looking at metabolic liver disease was that it's very poorly coded within UK Biobank. But what we were able to do is to look at a measure of liver fat content, which is this MR-derived um, uh, measurement, PDFF, which gives us a, sort of some kind of measure of liver fat content. And what I think you can see is interesting is that irregular shifts, and these are three different models with different um, uh, control for different confounders, but the irregular shift work seems to be associated with an increase in liver fat content. And currently, as you can see, we have nearly 4 million UK night shift workers and potentially we're exposing them to quite a number of uh, metabolic and inflammatory disease risks. Um, so in order to try to sort of make a little bit more mechanistic progress um, as a result of that, that observation, we uh, conducted an experimental medicine study using uh, NHS shift workers. And the design was fairly simple. We studied people either after three consecutive night shifts and allowing them a recovery period to sleep or after three consecutive day shifts. And just to sort of draw your attention to this um, uh, panel over here on the right of the slide, this is a me direct measure of uh, insulin sensitivity using a clamp. So we're infusing insulin at a constant rate, and then we have to hose in a certain amount of glucose to maintain glycemic control. And you can see that um, after the night shifts, these are the sort of filled black uh, circles, we need much less glucose um, because uh, these individuals are really quite profoundly uh, insulin resistant after only uh, three night shifts. Um, so that's sort of leading up, uh, and I suppose explaining how far we got. We're looking at human populations and some experimental medicine. I'd like to now go back to address the point that was raised about the specificity of the sort of engagement of the clock with our biology. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to go back a few years. Um, when we were first thinking about how clocks and inflammation may be working together. And this is some very simple, very reductionist experiments where we're just taking some mice and we're injecting them with lipopolysaccharide at different times of day. Um, just to draw your attention to this CT nomenclature. So, uh, so these are animals under constant conditions. So they're in constant darkness. They see no light at all. CT0 is when they would anticipate the lights would come on, and CT12 is when they would anticipate lights would go off. So this is sort of day and this is sort of night, but there are, these are all internal timing mechanisms driving this. The environment remains exactly the same. 
So you can see whether we look in serum or whether we look here at gene expression level, IL-6 response to exactly the same stimulus varies by you know, between two and threefold. Some other inflammatory cytokines also show a change, but importantly, others show no time of day variation, which we'll come back to um, a little bit later on. So we can also do similar studies in human macrophages. So these are human circulating monocytes differentiated for two weeks in a dish. So they're a long way out of, um, out of the person. And we can synchronize the, the, those macrophages by giving them a serum shock. And then we can challenge them with the same lipopolysaccharide at different arbitrary time intervals after that synchronization. And you can see that the excursion of response in IL-6 here to challenge remains gated by an internal timing system, even in these cells in a dish. I'm going to cut through this fairly quickly, but we were among the first to identify small molecular ligands, which bound to clock components, and we were able to show that we could modify clock function. And also a number of these molecules here, you can see inhibited production of the pro-inflammatory interleukin-6 in different types of human macrophage. I won't go through all the other controls, but this again says that there's an internal autonomous timekeeper that's powerfully regulating IL-6, and we can control that by using the clock. <clears throat> that's quite artificial, of course, and we wanted to sort of move a bit closer to sort of human relevance. So what we were doing now is, again, using a mouse model, um, we can persuade mice to inhale lipopolysaccharide in a very low dose, which just generates a, a, a modest inflammatory response, but in the lung now, and again, these are mice under constant conditions. And you can readily see that when we look at the bronchoalveolar vage, that is the fluid we can get from the lung, there was a lot more neutrophilic inflammation at CT0 than, than at any other time point. And you can see uh, that's you know the classic neutrophilic infiltration that you would expect and anticipate. We screened lots of cytokines, but only six showed a significant time of day variation. Um, and again, you know, IL-6 always comes up. But here, the, the oscillation of IL-6 didn't quite make sense with the neutrophilic inflammation. But CXCL5, which is a chemokine, powerfully uh, attracts neutrophils, uh, peaked around the same time as the peak neutrophilic uh, response. So I just bear that in mind. And again, I'm kind of indirectly asking your answering your question about the specificity, and specificity is very important. Do you see any pairing between uh, the secreted cytokines and the cognate receptors? Um, uh, the receptors, you know, the receptor, do, or are they yeah, so instant, just that, change the ligand? Yeah, again? mostly it's the case that one will change. So mostly it's the ligands that change, but the receptors stay relatively the same, certainly for this these components of the innate immune response. When you get into the adaptive immune response, then things change a little bit. And then when you, you're dealing with um, a more complicated system where you can have rhythmic trafficking of lymphocytes dominated, in fact, by rhythmic changes in adhesion molecules and endothelium rather than changes from within the, the lymphocyte itself, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, so the distracting question, that's when you perform these studies. Uh, is it one animal per cage, three animals per cage? No, so these are group housed. Yeah, these are group housed. Um, but some some studies we do uh, individually, but yeah, group housed. No difference. No, no. and we, we've done this you know, a lot of times. But um, so the other trick we can do, rather than sort of looking at the clock environmentally, is we can genetically disrupt the clock. So I showed you earlier a sort of cartoon of how the oscillator works. And um, I'm sure it, you know, I've got all kinds of stuff here. But anyway, female one is the only non-redundant circadian clock factor. So it's convenient because if we remove female one, then the cells cannot oscillate. So what we've done here is we've just targeted the bronchial epithelium. That's the, those are the cells lining the lung. So these are not professional immune cells, um, but um, we think they're important dominant timekeeping cells in the lung. And we've just removed female one, so the, the animal's completely rhythmic. It has a completely rhythmic immune system. It's just these epithelial cells can't tell time anymore. And um, <clears throat> we anticipated that we would lose the time of day variation in neutrophilic inflammation. Um, 
which we did. But the real surprise was when you disrupt the clock, you get a very powerful pro-inflammatory response. So this was not anticipated. And just to um, look, uh, um, uh, look yeah, we looked at this in, 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 in lots of different ways. And in order to try to find you know, what might be the culprit, we found that actually it was just this single neutrophil hemokine which was dysregulated. So the, it was very, very precise, um, the coupling through the clock to the inflammatory response through a single gene, which of course led us to suspect that if we remove that gene, we could break the link between the clock and lung inflammation. And again, to cut a long story short, um, uh, that was the case. We actually didn't do this ourselves. It was done by a colleague in Philadelphia who initially didn't believe there was any time of day change. But when he did the experiment himself, he found, in fact, you know, about a fourfold variation. And um, uh, in his knockouts, he found that that fourfold variation was completely abolished. So um, CXDL5 is a very important link then between the clock and inflammation. It's, it's also one of the most glucocorticoid sensitive chemokines. It always comes up as the most sensitive. And um, as I was talking to you earlier, glucocorticoids are widely used, very powerful anti-inflammatories, and they're used very effectively to treat lung inflammation, including most recently dexamethasone in treatment for uh, COVID uh, pneumonia. So here we're now looking at the intersection between the um, uh, the, the actions of glucocorticoids, the clock and inflammation. And you can see that in, an, in, in, antic, in, in an intact animals, sorry, the CXCL5 um, uh, concentration does vary through time. But if we remove adrenal glands from the animals, so they no longer have um, glucocorticoids, um, then that effect is gone. So this led us to suspect that perhaps it was the glucocorticoids which themselves are very, very strongly circadian in terms of their production might be the might be the explanation. This is a chip sequence, this is a chip PCR. So this is now looking at the binding of the glucocorticoid receptor to its target site, its regulatory site on the CXCL5 gene here. And you can see <clears throat> that in, in healthy animals, you get a very major time of day variation in GR recruitment. But if we disrupt BMAL1 <clears throat> just in those epithelial cells, then that affects the recruitment of the glucocorticoid receptor across the whole lung. So a very powerful effect. And as you'd expect, as we're losing this repressive influence, we get an induction here of the active chromatin marks, which all fits with the, the phenotype. So therefore, we predicted that if we do target the cell clockwork in those bronchial epithelial cells, maybe therapeutic glucocorticoids wouldn't be able to be effective. And that's always interesting because we would like to get greater efficacy from therapeutic glucocorticoids with the ability to use lower doses and to avoid side effects. And as I show you, there's some evidence from clinical trials that time of day does affect efficacy. So we have a little bit of information to support us in this. And this is just looking at using synthetic glucocorticoid dexamethasone, which of course became famous as the first treatment for COVID pneumonia, which typically, as you see in wild type animals, powerfully inhibits production of CXCL5 in the lung. This is with LPS and this is dexamethasone with the LPS. You can see just disrupting that clock gene in the epithelium completely stops that effect. And if we look at the reduction of neutrophilic inflammation, here you see more than 50% reduction in control animals, and that's completely abolished just by disrupting the clockwork. So to summarize so far, um, it's kind of really interesting set of specificities emerge in that we've found a single cell type out of about 90 different cell types in the lung, which seem to be the dominant timekeepers, and we can interfere with the clock there and generate uh, major phenotypes. And we've identified a single gene, a single chemokine, as a link between the clock and, uh, and lung inflammation. This both requires an adrenal signal, but also local clockwork for rhythmic. Yeah. So what about the sense that, does the BML knockout take down the glucocorticoid receptor in the clarisomes? No, no. The, the 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 expression of the glucocorticoid receptor remains the same. It's just it's unable to. 
to navigate through to its binding site. And we don't fully understand how that works. Translocation of cytoplasm to the yeah, it gets into the nucleus, but it doesn't it doesn't seem able to bind to chromatin. So I think, yeah, but we'll, we'll come on, we may come on to that. I think that there's, the clock is responsible for a rhythmic access, uh, ry rhythmic chromatin remodeling and accessibility of transcription factors. Um, but what about um, um, uh, the other way around? I've been talking about inflammation as if it's universal or a bad thing, but of course it's not. And we need an inflammatory response in order to protect ourselves from infection. So we wanted to sort of now look sort of the other way around and see what happens to um, uh, channels in response to an infectious challenge. And um, so these are animals infected with pneumococcus, which is a prevalent cause of lung inf infections and lung pneumonia. And we're looking 24 hours after either infection during the day or infection during the night, not much going on. But two days after infection, you see the night infected animals, which of course mice are nocturnal, this is their active phase, they're getting significant protection from pneumonia and significant reductions in the septicemic um, response as well. So here, we're, we're, we're hypothesizing we're getting sort of gain of um, inflammation and perhaps a gain of protection. So again, so perhaps to cut a bit of a long story short, we isolated the cause of this phenotype down to the clock operating in the macrophage cells now. And here we're able to show that our favorite clock gene, BMAL1, when it was deleted here in these cells, uh, the macrophages became superphagocytes. So we're able to monitor this by basically feeding macrophages with bacteria that fluoresce when they're in the acidic lysosomal compartment. So we can count how efficiently the macrophages are digesting and killing the bacteria. And you can see that disruption of BMAL1 results in superphagocytes, which is kind of an interesting phenotype. And I'll see if the video works. I don't have, um, let's see, oh, maybe, maybe we'll, are they going to work? Oh, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Anyway, um, the, um, the, the when you look at the macrophages, they look very, very different. So these are wild-type macrophages. You can see this, these thick red lines are dense cortical actin, and whereas in the absence of BMAL1, the macrophages are rounded and look completely different. So there's a very major change in the cytoskeletal architecture in response to disrupting the clock. And that's a BMAL1 dependent process. Uh, what's interesting is that if we examine these two populations of macrophages, you can see that under unstimulated or resting conditions, this is looking at phosphoproteomics, looking at the phosphoproteome, the red dots are all phosphoproteins at different abundance. You see lots of differences. But after the macrophages see bacteria, there are very few differences. So what's actually happening is that by removing BMAL1, we shift the macrophages from a resting state into a vigilant state. So they're already activated. So now, when they encounter bacteria, they're, they're, their cytoskeleton is already remodeled for phagocytosis and for hunting and killing the bacteria. And we were able to sort of work out the mechanism here. And it turns out, interestingly, that rho A, which is a sort of master regulator of the active cytoskeleton, we can measure active rho A here. And when we remove BMAL1, you see these cells have got constitutively active rho A. So they're kind of constitutively ready to go. <clears throat> and we've been trying to sort of, I guess, address some of the points here about, you know, exactly how is the clock uh, able to do all these complex regulatory things. I'll just show you a couple of slides. This is still work in progress, but this is looking at macrophage gene expression by time of day and also um, uh, female one dependence. So as you would expect, we have a cluster of genes which are all to do with the core circadian clock. We have a cluster of genes here which are all to do with cytokines, cytokine receptors, uh, cell adhesion molecules. And then interestingly, we have a and cluster genes over here, which encode proteins which are involved in um, transmembrane trafficking and antigen presentation. So the interface between the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. So we're pursuing those further. Now, of course, in terms of human health, the burden is really with chronic uh, inflammatory disease. 
And so we were interested in studying this. Um, and what we've done some studies in people with rheumatoid arthritis, but here we're making use of a, an animal model of chronic inflammatory arthritis. And just to show you, this is measuring pore size, um, and these are on consecutive days, either during the day or during the night. So you can see there's a there's a change in the extent of the um, joint inflammation by time of day in the same way that people with rheumatoid arthritis experience a, time, a change in joint stiffness, joint pain by time of day. So this gives us some uh, confidence that uh, the, the model is at least reporting uh, some relevant aspects of the human biology. And again, if we look here, IL-6 uh, again uh, emerges as elevated in, in our model and, and also is very impressively uh, circadian rhythmic, uh, as are a number of other, uh, and as are a number of other uh, cytokines and, and chemokines. So we felt we had a, a kind of good experiment system to study. I'd like to sort of just draw your attention to the extent to which um, the circadian machinery is able to um, regulate uh, gene expression. So this is looking um, uh, uh, now uh, within a joint and we're looking, um, each column is a different circadian uh, phase or time. Um, the naive animals are here and the ones with the arthritis are over onto the right. Each horizontal line is a different gene and they've been grouped by rhythmicity. So you can see this is a gene which is rhythmic in health but loses rhythm in, uh, in arthritis. And you can see huge numbers of genes which are normally rhythmic lose rhythmicity in inflammatory arthritis. But what we found interesting, I guess, because we might have predicted that, was we found a whole bunch of genes which are normally not rhythmic, but expressed in the joint, which only acquire a rhythm in the presence of arthritis. So of course, this is interesting if your drug is targeting one of these newly rhythmic genes, then knowing that and timing uh, the administration to um, the uh, peak expression of your drug target could be quite important in terms of drug development and thinking through trial design. So what's about that? Um, the, interestingly, we found that um, the inflammation in the joint was also resulting in changes in rhythmicity elsewhere. And of course, one of the problems people suffer with with chronic inflammatory arthritis is they don't die of inflamed joints. They tend to die of accelerated cardiovascular disease. And we we're interested in this um, comorbidity or multimorbidity that's seen and, and seen as a, a major problem with chronic inflammation. So again, we thought this might be an interesting model to try to understand. So we see um, a bunch of genes here in the liver now lose rhythmicity with chronic arthritis and, and some genes gain rhythmicity. Um, the liver is an interesting immunologically privileged organ and um, we didn't see any change in cellular composition. So you don't get in, in, inflammatory cells taking up residence in the liver or anything like that. These are the same cells because their gene expression profile is changing. And if we look at the core clock genes here, you see most of them re remain rhythmic, but you can see there are some differences in their expression um, in, in, the, uh, in the liver in response to arthritis. When we tried to group these uh, differentially regulated genes functionally, we found some circadian changes. So here, these are genes that go up and go down, and these, this, this, these columns refer to gain and loss of rhythmicity, but rather small changes in rhythmicity confined to cytokine and chemokine signaling. But now, when we look at phosphoproteomics in the liver, um, we, I think we're getting a bit closer to, 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 to something useful. So this is profiling phospopeptides through time. Again, this is in healthy animals, and this is in the chronic arthritis over here on the right. So again, you can see a bunch of um, normally rhythmic phosphopeptides lose rhythm and, and, and others gain. We also found some really interesting patterns where rhythmicity was retained, but there was a phase inversion. So that gene, the, the phosphopeptides that normally peak during the rest phase are now peaking during the active phase. So again, the 
This is a rather complex rewiring of the connections between the clock and its outputs, rather than the clock becoming broken, as it were. Are you just to clarify, mm. these are fossil proteomics and yeah. we have RNA data. So does the RNA also show that pattern or is this post, just a post-translational modification? So, so we, we see more changes in the, we see changes in both, but we see more changes in the phosphor proteins than in the RNA. And as you probably know, and which has been well rehearsed, the, the correlations between mRNA, changes in mRNA, mRNA abundance and changes in protein abundance are, are not always very close. And we're now looking at uh, phos the phosphorylation, which is you know an important um, post-translation modification, but also gives a nice surrogate for changes in activity of, of proteins in, in the liver. But yeah, so I, we see more when we get at the phosphoprotein than we did when we were looking at gene expression. Um, and again, when we now look at changes with gain and loss of rhythms, we see um, more um, in the protein analysis than we saw with the transcript analysis in terms of um, uh, uh, terms which, which are gaining or losing uh, luminosity. So if I can sort of just try and sort of draw some of that together, we also profiled the metabolome at the various time points, and we've integrated the metabolome with gene expression and with the phosphoprotein. And there's a group of metabolites that really emerged very strongly for us and just want, wanted to sort of close the talk by, uh, by looking at these as interesting uh, metabolites, potentially linking chronic inflammation with changes in energy metabolism. So um, this is liver, metabolomics, uh, plasma here, and then muscle here. Um, just first of all, if you look at sphingomyelins, which are complex fatty acid derivatives, you can see that, again, in health is on the left and in the chronic inflammatory arthritis on the right, you can see in health some of the sphingomyelin species within the liver show quite a strong time of day variation in abundance, which is completely lost in the animals with the arthritis. And other sphingomyelin species acquire a rhythm only in the presence of arthritis. I also wanted to draw your attention to the ceramide species, uh, which are quite close to sphingomyelin. And here we saw a huge induction of all time points in terms of the concentration of um, all of the ceramides that we profiled. And ceramides are interesting for a number of reasons. Their production is known to be increased by inflammation, and they're strongly linked with insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome as well. The links with accelerated cardiovascular disease are certainly not as clear as they are, for, for example, for cholesterol, but there is an association between ceramides and accelerated cardiovascular disease, which, which is of interest. One of the problems with studying ceramides is that their production is quite complex when there are three routes, um, a de novo synthesis and a salvage pathway, which give rise to the ceramide species. So the biochemistry is a bit complicated. But just sort of playing out what we think is happening, we think here, if we look at the fatty acids in the liver, we see these normally very rhythmic in health. Now they lose rhythm in one of inflammatory arthritis. And what we think is happening is the fatty acids are being shunted into ceramide production, which is explaining why there's accumulation of ceramides. And again, to cut a long story short, we see defects in beta oxidation of fatty acids in the liver. And we also see increased production of ketones. So it's more complicated <clears throat> than just ceramides. But the ceramides do play an interesting uh, structural and signaling role. Uh, they're produced by fatty acid from fatty acids under the influence of a STAT3 signaling cascade. And they are intercalated into the plasma membrane where they affect transmembrane receptor function. They also intercalate into mitochondrial membranes and affect energy production. So these are kind of quite important um, molecular species. But what about their, their role in the clock? So um, it turns out these ceramides are, are not just structural, but they also have important signaling properties. And if we just look at, across the top here, we're now looking at a, um, uh, this is the circadian readout. So these are liver cells, which are transgenic from a female one reciferase. So we get light output under the control of the clock. So if you look at the blue line, you can see these liver cells oscillate beautifully. 
If we feed them C2 ceramide, or sorry, C2 ceramides, then you can see in the red line that the clock oscillation is essentially abolished. We can in, in, um, use an inhibitor of ceramide degradation, this DEMAP, and as you can see, when you titrate that in, it also reduces the amplitude here. If you compare the yellow line with the control ethanol vehicle, which is in blue, quite profound effects on the function of the circadian oscillator. Of course, that's tricky because you know we might be you know, screwing the cells up and then they lose rhythm. Well, you, what's also perhaps more persuasive, more persuasive, is if we use an inhibitor of ceramide synthesis. So this limits the nova synthesis of ceramides in those liver cells. What we see is that compared to the vehicle, which is in the red line here, as we inhibit ceramide synthesis, we actually dial up an increase in amplitude. So this is kind of you know quite nice evidence that there's a um, there's a sort of rheostatic relationship between intracellular ceramide abundance and the operation of the core circadian oscillator. Um, we're not the only people to have detected uh, 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 a connection between um, ceramides and and the operation of the core circadian clock. These are colleagues in uh, in Geneva, and again, if you just Look here, I mean, their oscillations aren't really as beautiful as ours, but what can one say? Um, <laughs> um, this is the myriosin, the inhibitor of ceramide synthesis, and you can see you get higher amplitude oscillations and um, uh, in, in the red. So uh, I think that, that this is emerging as a, a, another interesting um, circadian metabolic um, interface. So this is my kind of final slide. Um, Hopefully, I've uh, persuaded you that so, circadian biology is something interesting to think about um, and may play an interesting role in connecting some of the comorbidities we see with, say, for example, chronic inflammation. We know that chronic inflammation does impact on system-wide energy metabolism, but what we've been able to do, I think, here is to identify that, that to fully understand those connections, we do need to take into account the role of the clock because clock is both important for regulating inflammation and also energy metabolism. It's far more complex than simply inflammation wrecking the clock. What we see is a system-wide rewiring of circadian energy, energy metabolism in response to chronic inflammation. I showed you evidence that certain metabolites, genes and proteins lose oscillations and others gain oscillations in the, chronic, in, in the context of chronic inflammation and that's both in the site of inflammation and also at distant sites such as the liver, which are critical for, for um, system-wide energy homeostasis. Um, we've got some uh, interesting, I think, new data looking at, in particular, ceramide and sphingomyelin metabolism in chronic inflammation as a potential uh, link into lipid metabolism and connecting the lipid, lipid metabolism and sensing of lipid metabolism to the core circadian oscillator. So to conclude, um, circadian control of physiology is pervasive. Um, Multimorbidity, uh, which remains a controversial term, I think, may be underpinned by sleep and circadian rhythm disruption. Uh, chronic inflammation rewires circadian lipid metabolism with emergence of new bioactive lipid species, for example, ceramides, which may be playing important effector roles. And I'd just like to thank funders of the work and um, colleagues in the labs who've done all the work and also uh, colleagues with whom I've enjoyed collaborating over like, 20 years or so. And to you, of course, for your uh, attention. Thank you very much. Well, you, you overrode my tendency to fall asleep post lunch. So it was really, really fascinating. Um, could anyone who can speak uh, ask that? You should. Hey, uh, as, as, as somebody who's worked in the labs for a long time, then transitioned to humans, it, do you think a lot of what you've discovered in the labs is applicable to humans and vice versa? Or do you think actually there is really good parallel? Yeah, so it's really interesting. Um, and uh, mice are nocturnal and humans are diurnal and so on. Um, the uh, difference between nocturnal and diurnal has been studied fairly extensively. The SCN clock follows light in both nocturnal and diurnal animals. 
everything downstream of SCN is um, phase inverted uh, between you know, nocturnal and diurnal. Um, but almost all that we see in the mouse has a, a human, a strong human correlate. And we tried where possible to uh, to sort of get face validity by doing uh, human experimental mm -hmm. medicine stuff or by looking in big cohorts, looking at this sort of epidemiology kind of to, 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 to try to make connections. I think because if you look in terms of evolutionary time, the clock is as kind of a, a super system probably arose at the time of the great oxygenation after photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. And it's probably an adaption to, to handle uh, reactive oxygen species stress. Mm -hmm. And then because it's proved useful, various other bits of biology got sort of draped onto the operation of the clock. But because it's so ancient, I think it does make it, you know, probably more of a reliable um, uh, uh, system to study across species. And it's fascinating, you know, the fungal people, the plant people, the plant people are seeing circadian variation in resistance to things like caterpillars, for example. Uh, and it, it's, 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 a, it's, I think, probably because it's so ancient. But other mediators that you identify, are they homologues in Mouse or yeah, well, so IL-6 is, is, is yeah. directly the same, but uh, CXTL5 rather similar. Um, I, so we don't have quite an IL-8 um, uh, 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 correlation, but, but I, think, I think it's probably not the individual genes, but rather the processes that they subserve. No, that's being impressive. I don't know if there's anyone online from the ecology group. There was a paper from PNAS about three or four years ago yeah. from the ecology group here who collected mice, wild mice from around and and compared them with all of the parameters what you saw, what you actually saw in wild mice when you had the time of day, they were dots, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Compared them to lab mice. And this was a paper which only ended up in PNAS. It's interesting that the review story of it is interesting because there's lots of groups who are vested interest in it not appearing. <laughs> And, it, and its bottom line is the laboratory mice are a useless model for wild mice, let alone, <laughs> <laughs> let alone for humans. I'll, 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 I'll send it to you, to you both. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing paper. And, mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it's IL-6 is one of the main things that they, they, focus, they, on. they, they focus on in, in, uh, in that. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> so... Uh, well, uh, 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 conspiracy theories aside about uh, undoing all of mouse genetic remembrance strains. Um, outstanding seminar. I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, maybe a couple questions, but uh, if you condition on IL-6, i.e. mouse models are not at IL-6, how much of the response is blunted? I know you said there are other contributors, but just how much of the IL-6 contributes to the overall human? Yeah, so well, we we haven't done that, so I, I don't I don't think anyone has I don't think anyone has done that actually. Okay. Well, it looks like a good little experiment. Yeah. Um, second, I, I was intrigued by two things, or uh, well, many things too. I'll ask you about. Uh, one was this rapid opening and closing of chromatin mm. that you have kind of inferred is how the glucoid receptor may or may yeah. not gain access. That sounds fascinating to me. That's going. To so chromatin accessibility is going to toggle so quickly. So I was wondering how you think that. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't show any data. So it's we're still working on that. So we've got a, a grad student who that's her project at the moment. It's um, we've had encountered a few kind of issues along along the way, but um, broadly speaking, what we think is happening, and this is using ATAC-seq by time of day, um, and also conditioning on BMAL1 loss. Um, it took us a little while, but we've got, I think, really clear evidence now of uh, time of day variation in ATAC um, accessibility. And um, when we started that, uh, colleagues who focus on transcription were very unconvinced that we'd find anything. They, they felt that Probably the ATAC was going to give us, you know, enhancers, but wouldn't tell us about function, and we'd have to do H3K27 or something like that, which we're also doing, by the way. But but it's really interesting that the the that the we think one of the ways in which the clock is operating is by gating access to other transcription factors, which we, we we're currently focusing on macrophages. Um, the 
long to let reveal yourselves are very hard because they're very difficult to get in sufficient numbers to do these kinds of studies. I think when, when we were in the pub, you mentioned we discussed that people here are doing a study of looking at the very short term rhythms yeah. within the day yeah. of methylation and mm. this notion of it, you know, methylation being stable is that mm. it's actually stable through change. Mm -hmm. But the actual thing is actually on off, on off, on off. Mm. So it depends uh, when you get it. And the, mm. Doing that with a with a, sam a sampling device that, that was yeah. uh, introduced, looking at cortisol, yes. and trying to do yes. that stuff of light when that's right, yes. yeah. it works. So we're looking mm. at this issue of uh, uh, I don't know Matt Suderman or anyone's online anyway. Mm. So a lot of those genes again with Miss T mm. with systemic infection. I wonder if you speculate are they contributing to pathology or will they be protected pathway? Um, I I think it's. Um, a, a mixture. So, if we look at the sort of gene ontology, a, a bunch of them are contributing to the pathology in that they're the, the kind of suspects that you see get stirred up when there is an in inflammation. But I think there's some anti inflammatory um, uh, processes also uh, acquire rhythmicity. And I think that uh, if I can sort of slightly segue to answer your question in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. Fairly consistently, when 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 we if we disrupt um, BMAL one or if we disrupt uh, reverb alpha, which is sort of downstream of, of BMAL one, um, we not only lose time of day regulation of inflammation, but in almost all cases, you get an exaggerated inflammation sort of all the time. So what I think is 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 happening is that the function of the clock on inflammation is this, is a rhythmic repression. And I think it's that rhythmic repression is 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 part of the um, uh, sort of resolution uh, mechanism for for inflammation potentially. Um, but it's 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 also I mean, I, I wonder if anyone's going to pick it up. But nobody's asked a question about it. But, uh, but the, the 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 circadian phase at which different inflammatory things seem to reach their 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 peak. It isn't always consistent, um, okay, which is also interesting. So in in certain types of challenge, we got to the peak excursion was at dusk or subjected dusk, even in circadian conditions. But when we did lung inflammation, the peak inflammatory excursion was at dawn and we're using LPS, which primarily activates macrophages. Um, but we think that within the context of an organ, there is a sort of local timekeeping, and certainly, in, for example, in the lung, these epithelial cells seem to be playing a sort of dominant um, effect and sort of conveying timing information to the sort of local resident macrophage populations. Which again, it, there's the communication of timing information between cells within peripheral organs is just gaining a bit of momentum, and there are some candidate molecules. TGF beta emerges as one. There was some recent publication from group in Berlin, and there may be others um, that are capable of doing this. Possibly also some prostaglandins may, may be able to do that. And bringing out to the level of population, in cohort studies like ULSPAC or Ecobiobank, there are signals for a number of inflammatory proteins being disrupted or associated with psychiatric conditions like depression, mm. psychosis. IL-6 being one of the most commonly replicated. In the population data, any suggestions do you have how to model this circadian variation in proteins like IL-6? Mm, well, that's really interesting. Um, you're possibly asking the wrong person, but <laughs> um, well, I think I think you're you're right. And don't, uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not a you know, biological psychiatrist, but the links between um, uh, sort of mental illness and sort of um, uh, inflammation. Are, are, there's a lot of evidence, I think, uh, for that. Um, there are there's evidence that um, in the um, association of genes which are associated with sleep and chronotype things that also associate with um, uh, neuropsychiatric traits, and we know that they also impact on inflammation. So, I I think it might be slightly tricky. <laughs> Really, sort of tease that out, but um, but yeah, I think it's I think it's, it's, I think it's interesting. Yeah, we've done some of these studies where we look at levels of inflammatory proteins, so whether that's 
a single biomarkers like IL-6, CRP that are available or recently O-Link explored a whole range yeah. of proteins and you see this have disruptions across a number of proteins. Mm. It's one problem we encounter on like experiments where we actually are not, unless we look back at time of sample collection, we can't really look at it. But again, that's not within individual, that's in different individuals mm. might have given someone at different times. So it's difficult to compare. I've noticed you've done something in the biobank. So whether there is any good reasonable proxies of mm. modeling the cytokine effect, because diurnal variation in mood, like rheumatoid arthritis, yeah. it's a classical symptoms of depression. Patients yeah. are feeling worse in mood in the morning. Yeah. And then it's getting better by the afternoon. Exactly. So, so, so then we caught us all of course, which shows a big diurnal variation. People just people are just to the time of collection, and then and people have looked at to see whether it's actually the time of collection or the time of collection in relation to when people actually get up. Um, we did this with minus 40 years ago, nearly. Uh, and it was basically it's the time. It's not it's not in relation to how long it's the, it's the time whether you could whether you could up an hour before or four hours before. And so if you if you just look at any of the papers that are reportable on using blood cortisol and out outcomes. They correct for this sinusoidal uh, um, function mm. at particular, a particular time. And the time of sample collection <laughs> in UK Biobank is recorded. Mm. And uh, some people have been using that together with time of last meal, for example, to say, to try and get a better handle on what metabolites mean. Mm. It's just some, you know, well, half, of, half of them just sunk up. Uh, uh, but that's true. I mean, John Todd and their group have done looked at seasonal effect, yeah. as you know, in EDMCs, yeah. the mm -hmm. machinery firing yeah. up in winter months compared to summer months. Mm -hmm. So I suppose is this still useful if we look at timing of blood collection and how this protein level behave, mm -hmm. albeit not in within that particular individual, mm -hmm. but among groups of individuals? Mm -hmm. uh, I I mean I think it I think it is. Um I mean, most collections, though, are not. We don't sort of sample through the full 24 hours. <laughs> so if you look, what people tend to do is like, you know, morning versus afternoon in order to try and get you some power. And if you look at the studies where people looked at outcomes from cardiac surgery, you know, it, there's a difference in outcome if you have a morning or an afternoon operation, for example. We've done stuff looking at lung transplant through the circadian period. And there's sort of a, a peak time for early transplant rejection and so on. So you can do those kinds of studies. They're messy because, of course, we're always using the time of the clock on the wall and we know that within human populations, chronotype varies <laughs> a little bit. Um, so that's slightly problematic. One of the things that would be really good is if we had uh, like a serum biomarker for circadian phase, because then you'd then be able to use that to give you your sort of biological phase for that individual. And then you could use that as a filter for all of the metabolized gene expression. So currently, um, a number of groups are working on this through a variety of different algorithms. And, and basically, because there are 12 clock genes, um, and uh, you know, if you, if you have gene expression, you can sort of roughly work out where you are in the oscillation. But if we could do, we could probably do something similar with metabolites. And there have been some algorithms published you know 12 or 20 different types of different metabolites all of which have a strong circadian oscillation but the, the oscillation is all slightly out of phase therefore if you get a snapshot you should be able to work out roughly you know, you can do the math better than me but yeah, yeah we, we're not quite there yet but i think that will be really helpful to address your, your question thank you and there's a there's a question online uh well, yeah, you can probably read it better than i can yeah sure um yeah i'll hang off the media um uh, yeah, so um, uh, so if you're referring to that sort of study we did on NHS shift workers, um, it might be worth reading it. For oh yeah, oh, fair enough. oh yeah, fair enough. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, so, would insulin resistance be related to the eating patterns of individuals doing night shifts, i.e., not having dinner and just snacking through the night, therefore keeping insulin levels constantly high? And, and yes, for sure. But when the way we did our study was. We just looked at the conditioning effect of three nights. We then allowed the individuals to go home, sleep, recover, and all the individuals were studied after the same period of fasting 
duration. So, yeah, um, obviously, insulin is going to be a dynamic response to your immediate nutritional state, but we think your liver insulin sensitivity gives us a sort of a longer term readout of what's happened before. But undoubtedly, it is caused by eating at the wrong time of day because although the liver clock will in health tend to be aligned with the suprachiasmatic nucleus clock and the light dark, dark cycle if you're eating at the wrong time of day your liver clock will tend to follow eating time and will become separated from the uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus time and that, that is the misalignment you've got clocks running at, in, in out of phase so it's so uh, it's it's gone two o'clock, but David's going to stay around so mm. if you want to come and ask him questions personally now, uh, and he's staying around this afternoon as well. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so really fascinating seminar. Lots lots more questions. So thank you.